Thank you for that, Cody, and I want to thank uh, the MRA for putting together such a great day of panel discussions, presentations, lots of great education. Uh, my name is Minas Kazoulis um, from Johnson & Johnson. I'm the Scientific Engagement Director uh, in R&D uh, at, at Consumer Health. Um, you might know some of the brands that we um, manufacture, brands like Neutrogena and Novino. Uh, we have a, a huge commitment in really trying to um, help society you know, in terms of living healthy, active lives, uh, protecting people from preventable skin damage, skin cancers, even melanoma. Um, and we do a lot of research in that space from behavioral research uh, to better understand what makes people tick, what motivates people to uh, under, like, understand what kind of prevention measures they should be uh, employing. Because I think we all have uh, a the goal in mind, I think, in this room to not only treat melanoma, but find ways to hopefully prevent it in the future and really change that trajectory uh, that we've seen over the last two, three decades. Um, with that, it's also a personal topic for me too because I myself have had melanoma. I was lucky for it to be detected at a very early stage. Uh, my mother-in-law, unfortunately, was diagnosed at a later stage. She's doing fine, which is great. Uh, but when I think about my own family's personal journey, I think of my kids, I think of my family members, how do we educate them, how do we get ahead of it, you know, to make sure that we're preventing this. And so with that, really honored to be able to set up this discussion for you um, and introduce the panel uh, that will be leading the discussion on, on uh, prevention. Um, and with that, you know, leading the panel will be Tracy Callahan, who's a five-time uh, survivor of melanoma. Um, she is the founder and president of Polka Dot Mama uh, Melanoma Foundation. Um, she's joined by Dr. Susan Sweater uh, from Stanford University, Dr. Maria Wei from the University of California, San Francisco, and Dr. Rachel Vogel from the University of Minnesota. So look forward to the discussion. Thank you, I think it's working great. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, as mentioned, my name is Tracy Callahan, and I've been diagnosed with early stage melanoma five times, four in situ and a stage 1A last year. I was first diagnosed with melanoma at age 38, and I am now 47 and a half, um, so I've been dealing with this for quite a few years. Um, I'm a nurse by training, and honestly, in nursing school, really didn't learn a lot about melanoma or skin cancer and was pretty floored uh, the first time I was diagnosed. My melanoma was actually identified by my husband. Um, he noticed a changing spot, and I went in and really thought nothing of it until I got the phone call. And uh, at that time, uh, I felt like the world was racing around me, yet I was paralyzed with fear and not knowing what this was gonna mean for me or my children, who were at the time five and seven. Um, and, you know, I wanna, we're going to talk a lot about what is it like living and living in fear. And some of the fears that I experienced that I wasn't prepared for was that I would have to go see the dermatologist every three months and have been going every three months uh, for, you know, almost 10 years now. Uh, they keep me on a short leash. Um, 10 wide excision surgeries because I wasn't aware that then I would also be diagnosed with severely dysplastic moles, which resulted in more surgeries. Um, and the fear that happens to this day, every single time I go to the doctor and I start sweating, I use humor, they all know me very well, um, but I realize that I'm, I'm scared and coping and every time I have a biopsy and the phone rings, I know that either it's gonna be a great day or I'm gonna have to deal with something else. Now in the end, I know I'm very lucky because all of my melanomas were caught early, but I've learned to be kinder and gentler to myself in knowing that these fears are valid, they're warranted, and they're okay. Um, and really for me, I've learned that it's important to acknowledge that my melanoma is not going to be something that I ever forget about, but is really more of a chronic illness. And now that I've actually owned that and accepted it, I feel like I can live with it versus fighting it and trying to ignore it and hoping it would go away. Um, but along with fears that have occurred to me throughout the years have been, I suddenly wanted to become a hermit. Um, I love the sun and I love traveling and I suddenly wanted to go nowhere and I was afraid to go to my kids' swim meets, their, basket, their base, baseball games, um, you know, all of it. I felt myself staring at my children's moles, becoming obsessed, all these things that I wasn't quite prepared for. But 
over the years, with the help of some amazing um, dermatologists in my life, I realized that I had to start living and that I could do it safely. I started um, finding the best sunscreen that worked for me. My dermatologist had said the best sunscreen is the sunscreen you'll wear. Best advice ever. Um, I invested in some UPF clothing, some pretty cool big hats. I started traveling to Hawaii, built a pool, um, and now people laugh and say, you garden, you have a pool. Um, but I really realized that you can live with melanoma, you just have to learn how to do it safely. So that's a little bit about how this has affected me, but now I can't wait to hear um, from our experts about um, their thoughts on this. So Dr. Rolgo, I'm gonna start with you. I know you do a lot of research in this area and I would love to hear about um, some of your findings. Yes, so uh, Tracy is my inspiration actually for a lot of the work that I do. So you know, today as a panel, we're gonna talk a lot about screening and primary prevention, um, but actually the work that I do is really focusing on secondary prevention. So preventing that second, third, fourth melanoma after the first one. Uh, and so I, thanks to the MRA and the American Cancer Society, I just completed a very large randomized controlled trial among melanoma survivors where we tried to change their behaviors, uh, to try to reduce their sun exposure. And, you know, and truthfully, I've spent a lot of time talking with melanoma survivors before we started this work. And you know, there are some people who decide they're still gonna indoor tan, there's some people who are still gonna, you know, do those things, but it's not very many, actually. Uh, you know, it's, it's startling every time I hear it, um, but it's really, you know, what I heard most often is, you know, I was, I was at my kid's soccer game and then their friend was playing and all of a sudden it was three hours later and I had a sunburn. Or I, I put sunscreen on my kids and I forgot about myself. I mean, so it was these unintentional sun exposures was really what was driving a lot of the sunburns that we were hearing from in these melanoma survivors. So, you know, pretty consistently in melanoma survivors, we're hearing about a third of them still experience a sunburn each year. And, you know, so for us, we're really trying to reduce those sunburns. Uh, so we ran a trial where we gave everybody a device, you know, similar to what we're all wearing right now, an Apple Watch. It's not an Apple Watch, but it's the same idea. I um, mean, it measures UV. And so with the idea that the people that were in the intervention, they just got that information right, right away. How much UV exposure were they actually getting? Um, and it really you know, kind of indirectly taught them, you get a lot more exposure at noon than you do at 7 a.m. And so maybe you're gonna start golfing at eight instead of noon. Uh, and so it was, it, it really, we found that that actually worked. Um, we were able to reduce, over the course of a summer, we got people to wear this for an entire summer, over the course of the summer, they reduced their total sun exposure per day by 25%. And again, it's really that idea that it's, it's unintentional, right? So I think, you, we, um, I think you would be surprised, honestly, of where you're getting some sun exposure. Um, and that was, I think, you know, really kind of the big takeaway from us for this. So thank you. Great, thank you for sharing. So we talk a lot about sun safety and primary prevention, and sunscreen is a hot topic. Sunscreen causes cancer, sunscreen this, don't buy this one, buy that one. I'd love to hear, Dr. Sweater, your take on that, because there's so much noise out in the community about sunscreen. Sure, I'll make sure this is on. First, I just have to thank um, Cody and, and Michael and everyone from the MRA, and just want to echo what Hussein and others have said. This has just been an enlightening and inspiring session. It's so wonderful to interact with survivors and advocates and caregivers and really helps us to move the ball forward across the prevention and treatment spectrum. Um, with prevention, just to note, we think about this primary prevention issue, it's no small feat. I mean, in 2015 or 2016, the CDC issued a report saying that between the years of 2020 and 2030, if we were to enact a national primary prevention comprehensive campaign in the U.S. for melanoma, we could prevent about 230,000 cases and avert about $2.7 billion in first-year treatment costs. So that's not related to costs for advanced treatment for expensive immunotherapies and targeted therapies, but first-year treatment costs for wide local excision, sentinel biopsy, et cetera. 
The issues we have, sunscreen remains sort of our best defense along with sun protective behaviors and clothing against melanoma development, particularly in individuals with lighter skin who are at highest risk. Though we have seen inequities and health disparities in melanoma burden in darker skin populations and particularly uh, racial ethnic minorities. With sunscreens, we have a multiple problems. I would say for me, the most frustrating thing is a 20-year effort to get superior sunscreen molecules or products or filters into the US and approved by the US FDA. There are better sunscreen filters abroad and I let every single one of my patients and all of my redhead patients who are at significantly higher risk of melanoma know about the avail availability of better UV filters. They've been used for decades very safely and effectively around the world and they're not in the US. And so I always am asked after this session and give people advice, we hand this out, it is legal to purchase your sunscreens from the broad, they are over the counter products. So one issue is just the inefficacy of our sunscreens. The other is the, the issues related to consumer safety and what are really probably myths more than realities about the safety of US sunscreens. So some of them um, that have been uh, touted by the Environmental Working Group, which is a consumer walk watchdog organi organization from years ago, dealt with um, estrogen disruption, parabens that might be causing cancer, which are in every, they're preservative in every cosmetic and over-the-counter lotion you have. Um, retinoids, which actually we use in higher doses to prevent skin cancer, particularly keratinocyte carcinoma in transplant populations who are immunosuppressed. And then issues with nanoparticles in those mineral sunscreens, the physical sunscreens being absorbed through the skin. And all of those have really been largely refuted. The biggest problem we have is that one of the chemicals, oxybenzone, is actually a potent photosensitizer, meaning it gives you a photosensitive rash. The other issue with that one is that it's been shown along with another ingredient in US sunscreens, I think it's octanoxate, to potentially damage coral reefs in laboratory settings. But if you talk to individuals about the issues with coral reef damage and the Environmental Protection Agency, this is a very small and very probably negligible reason that we see coral reef blight when we look at ocean acidity, climate change, ocean warming, pollution, many other things which are damaging to coral reefs. Nonetheless, Florida and Hawaii are now banning chemical sunscreens, which I think is a mistake because in the US, our mineral sunscreens just don't cut it. They don't do as good enough a job as even the chemical sunscreens in the US. You have to have a higher percentage of that micronized zinc oxide and, and titanium dioxide. And then finally, I just want to talk about absorption. The other two studies that were published in our you know, major journals, the New England Journal, were in the last two years, and they showed that if, if these sunscreens in the US were used to an inordinate degree in a laboratory setting, so not in a real life setting where individuals apply the actual amount of sunscreen to reach the, the, the advertised SPF, they did it four times a day for four days and they actually then measured blood levels and found that there weren't toxic or harmful levels of these various chemicals, but there were enough of a concentration in the blood to not waive further toxicology studies. So the FDA is going to be very judicious and say, well, we have to worry about absorption of the chemicals, but unfortunately, I think consumers hear this and say we can't use any sunscreens because they're not safe. So we have to really work on advertising, promoting safe sun messaging. Sunscreen is part of that in very young children, sun protection, having little children, infants out of the sun. Mineral sunscreens are fine for people with allergies to those chemicals. And frankly, I think we just have to do a better job of getting these chemicals into our sunscreens in the U.S. Thank you. Dr. Wei, we want people to learn how to live their life in the sun. Obviously, we just heard some great information about sunscreen, but are there other things that people should be thinking about? Other ways to stay sun safe? Yeah, and Tracy, I wanted to thank you <clears throat> for sharing your experiences. It's so valuable for us to hear as practitioners our uh, patients' experiences. Um, I wanted to add a little bit about sunscreen because um, we have just finished a study on sunscreen use and we're writing it up now. And one also uh, problem with sunscreen is the amount that people use. This is a, a critical problem and uh, we looked at the patients in our melanoma clinic who've had melanoma and none of them were using the right amount. Um, and so we did some testing of what was the most effective counseling, we looked at paper, which seems to be standard of care. You don't kind of hand um, a piece of paper that has suggested uh, sun protection uh, guidelines. Or we did a very um, sort of comprehensive 
uh, in-person counseling where we demonstrated with the patient's own sunscreen how much to put on. Because there are um, recommended volumes to put on to meet the SPF on the model. And some patients were aware of it, but most people weren't. And even those that were aware had no idea how to put that on because the sunscreen's all differ in viscosity, how runny it is, how thick it is, it looks different. So we were able to bring everybody up into the recommended uh, usage, but we followed it over time and it wasn't robust. People forgot after about three to six months. So we started to think about this and we said, well, one thing we could do is remind folks, right? But it seems like, you know, we see people for years. Would we do that? Is that effective? You know, when we thought about it, sunscreen is the gold standard prevention. So it's kind of like a medication that you put on topically. Um, in, in no other case for medication do we ask patients to measure out their medication, right? We're not giving you a pile of, um, you know, uh, cardiac medication and say, here, measure this out. Where, as people used to do that, actually, when uh, pharmacists first started. Um, so we're going to advocate that sunscreens actually be dispensed in a pump. So you know, do you do one pump, two pumps? One pump for your face, two pumps for your arms. So I think that's one way to get around that problem. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So in terms of what else, um, we actually think of sunscreen now as a secondary prevention in the sense that uh, physical barriers are better. So a uh, broad brim hat, long sleeves, long pants, and actually standing in the shade is very effective. Uh, studies that showed that folks that depended on sunscreen for their sun protection actually had a normal vitamin D level. And vitamin D goes down if you really are strict about your sun protection, so it's sort of a surrogate as to how much sun you're getting. Whereas people who stood in the shade or wore long pants, long uh, sleeves and hats had decreasing vitamin D and had to be supplemented. So um, simple things like just what you wear um, and we don't uh, necessarily say you have to wear SPF rated clothing, uh, although there are different kinds. There's the type that's dipped in chemicals, there's kind that's based on weave. I prefer the weave type. But really any clothing except for a loose weave white t-shirt material is good. Um, and it's very effective. And that way you can also minimize the amount of sunscreen that you use. One other thing we had talked about also is car window tinting. You know, Absolutely. that was something one of my melanomas was across the left side of my face. That's and, right. And, you know, as a busy mom and carpool and hours and hours, it never dawned on me until very recently to start exactly. having my car windows tinted. And it's something you can get online. Uh, you can order it and have a body shop mm -hmm. put on it. But don't get the tinted kind because, at least in California, that's illegal and the police yes. will stop you. <laughs> yeah. There's the clear type that's also UV protective. It's very useful. The windshield in front is fairly thick, and so it's a good protection, but it's really the side windows. And we'll often see people with much more sun damage. As a matter of fact, I think I'm a, an example of that because uh, I commuted back and forth for years, and you get a tremendous amount of sun that way, and also in your home. It's my understanding the tempered glass and the windshield, it, it will go through the far UVA spectrum. So it'll cover that shorter wave UVB and then the longer wave UVA spectrum. But like you said, the side windows don't. And I would just say, I think you brought up before, we, we don't want our melanoma patients to be hermits. And I can't use the word moles because moles right. to us is such a different thing. But we tell them to live a normal life and, and to live outside. And Marie and I are from California where the weather's beautiful and you know, the cost of living is high and you want to enjoy the outside and you're living in this great environment where there's a, a ton of year-round activities that you can enjoy outdoors. And so we never tell our patients to refrain from being outdoors and enjoying life. It's just to be careful and to practice whatever they will use, when they'll use it, whatever sunscreen they'll get on their skin. You know, there are ways to optimize this. And I think the behavioral approaches are really critical to that. Yeah. Thank you for reiterating that. So we talk a lot about knowing our skin. And, you know, I think it was Dr. Zhao that talked about ABCDEs. And, you know, for me personally, E has been the most important. Um, evolving, changing. Um, obviously, after the first melanoma, number two, number three, number four was all detected through changing spots. Number five, 
um, thanks to getting older, got a new pair of bifocals and noticed um, the, the 1A, and it was all spots changing. Um, but I'd love to hear more about your opinion on that and the A, B, C, D, especially E's, and what your thoughts are on that. We could start and go through this way, but um, so, so secondary prevention is really early detection, and, and you know, and, and then there's this goal, and additional, and there's additional primary prevention, which is therapeutic prevention, which we might, or chemo prevention, we might touch on at the end. But um, one of the things that you know we really focus on, of course, is skin self-examination, and then actually, I think now more empowering patients to advocate for themselves to perform that exam, to have a loved one look at their back and other areas they can't see regularly, and then to ask for a clinician skin exam. Because empowering the patients to advocate and self-advocate is really going to get patients into care earlier across all racial ethnic groups in rural areas where we have less specialty access, less dermatologist and oncologist access, and then now the increasing use of novel technologies, including AI-based smartphone apps and other things that we're trying to all work on with digital imaging outreach. So a lot of things have to do with that recognition of warning signs. Henson talked about E or for evolving um, or the ugly duckling sign. And I'll just say, you know, in, in, at my age now, almost 30 years into this melanoma career, a lot of younger people don't know what the fable of the ugly duckling is. And so we have to use the outlier. And, and we, when we have now done outreach to our, our very large Latinx population in California, the ugly duckling mnemonic doesn't mean anything. We have to talk about the outlier, the lesion that doesn't look like the rest. You can even go to Sesame Street, although our kids are kind of too old for that too. Which one of these does not match the other? But that's actually more, I think, an easier way for people to recognize. It's a pattern recognition. It's kind of this fast thinking versus slow thinking where people say, that just doesn't look right to me. It doesn't match the other, whether it's pink or brown, whether it's pigmented, whether it's raised or flat, it just stands apart from the rest. And that's been a very helpful way, I think, to promote self-detection. And then we work on focus group settings to understand those barriers to self-skin exams, whether they're socioeconomic, whether they're education-based, awareness-based, and then how can we craft those correct materials, those materials that reach out to populations to try to reduce the incidence of thick melanoma, the more lethal melanomas. Maria? Thanks, Susan. Um, that was pretty comprehensive. Um, so I, you know, a, a question that I often get from my patients is, what am I looking for? You know, I'm, I don't know what uh, a skin cancer looks like. And I often tell them, you know what, get to know your skin. Your homework is to get your no to know your spots and your bumps. Because as Tracy pointed out, really cancer is change. Cancer is um, uncontrolled growth. So anything that's on your skin that you see that stays the same, nothing to worry about, even if it looks, you know, quite alarming, which a lot of benign things do. Um, and I encourage them to use photos. We use total body photos in our clinic, and many clinics do, and we follow longitudinally. Um, uh, and we're starting to uh, do research in uh, technology and uh, leverage technology in following lesions. Uh, so Susan mentioned, for example, AI on clinical images as well as histopath images. Um, there's um, non-invasive screening of molecules on the skin that my lab's working on. I think that there's a lot on the horizon that's, um, I tell my patients, not quite ready for prime time, but certainly has a lot of potential and I think will really change the landscape of uh, skin cancer and melanoma screening. And then the only thing as the, as the non-MD up here uh, that I would add is, you know, remembering that not just the person who's had melanoma is at risk, but really we all are, um, and, you know, particularly family members. And so uh, the tip that I do, so I, my dermatologist thinks I'm crazy because I go in every year since I was 25. I go in for a full skin scan and I do it near Valentine's Day because every time Valentine's Day comes, I remember I love myself. I am getting a scan. And so, you know, just again, really kind of making it, making it routine, making it something that you do, advocating for yourself, as we heard a lot earlier, um, but remembering that, you know, it's not just you, but it's also your family members. Um, and, and really, we all are at risk of melanoma. That leads into actually my next question and point. So thank you for um, leading into that. that you know, that was something that was a bit of a surprise to me in, in talking to other melanoma patients is our loved ones. What does this mean for my boys? What does this mean, you know, for my, my sister? 
And I don't think that's something we often talk about, you know, that my boys are at a much higher risk given the fact that I've had five melanomas and would love to hear your take on, you know, what we should be doing for early detection and prevention of those that are genetically related to us. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I always tell my patients that, you know, most individuals don't warrant doing what's called germline testing for hereditary melanoma risk. There are specific criteria we follow based on the number of melanomas, invasive melanomas in particular, whether there may be other cancers like pancreatic cancer in which there can be a certain mutation that we want to test for and then do appropriate screening. And we've talked a little bit about some of the mutations today in BAP1. There's one P16 or CDKN2A that we will screen for inappropriate patients. But what I tell my melanoma patients is that, you know, most of the time what they inherit is the same color of skin, the same sensitivity to the sun, and then shared environmental exposures from all those trips to the beach, and particularly back in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s when sunscreens and sun protection practices weren't as robust. And so I think it's really important that we focus on first-degree relatives, siblings, children, parents to a certain extent. Um, we look for potential linkages where, which might promote us to do, again, cancer screening and particularly germline mutation testing. But educating, I mean, there's so many patients we see who say, I've got my melanoma, I told my brother to go in, and lo and behold, he had a melanoma in the back and no one even knew. And so it's a really important thing to think about with familial screening on that basis alone. I agree. Um, about 5%, um, maybe up to 10% in some cases, but we usually quote 5% of patients have a genetically related melanoma. So the vast majority are not genetic, but more behavioral. And also, you know, where you live um, and the activities that you do. Of course, in California, we're out there 24-7. And um, in our clinic, we really tailor our sun protective advice to the activities. So we have surfers, we have bicyclists, we have hikers, um, and we have uh, different tips for each of those types of activities, which I think is helpful. So one other thing that always surprises me when I meet someone that's been diagnosed with melanoma that calls me is, or if I've been to an event or a screening, that I think a lot of patients think, okay, I've been diagnosed and I'm sort of done with the dermatologist and I kind of cringe. I would love to hear what you, I know, you know, would sort of recommend for follow-up because I'm sometimes shocked. Oh yeah, I had a melanoma five years ago. I haven't seen a dermatologist in four years and I'm not a dermatologist, but it makes me cringe a little bit and I would love to hear um, what the dermatologists on the panel have to say about follow-up um, post-melanoma diagnosis. <laughs> I think, Rachel, you brought this up before. I mean, we really, about 4 to 6% of patients who have a single melanoma in the skin are at risk for a second primary melanoma, a new melanoma unrelated, not a metastasis. And then there are individuals, as you're well aware, who have multiple melanomas. I think the max for me has been 13 and a 37-year-old, one stage 3, and she's doing fine. But we see her every three months, and she has the hardest mole pattern ever to follow, but you know, she's used to more biopsies than we like to do, and now of course we're incorporating technology. But we really try to tailor the follow-up schedule based on the risk for recurrence of the melanoma, so a higher stage to begin with, a stage two, we're gonna follow that patient a lot more closely, especially early on when that risk of recurrence is highest in the first two to three years, we might add imaging, and now we might have adjuvant therapy with the approval of PEMBRO for resected stage 2B and 2C melanoma. Someone with a stage 1 melanoma who doesn't have very many moles will at least like to see them about every six months for two years, then once a year for life. Again, we tailor it to the patient's risk for new melanoma based on their mole pattern, family history, personal history of melanoma, and, and then we base it on the risk of recurrence. So there's no one size fits all in, in the guidelines, and I have chaired our American Academy of Dermatology Melanoma Guidelines work group in 2019 and serve as the current chair for the NCCN Melanoma Panel. We really wanna give clinicians and patients latitude, but really emphasize the key aspect of getting followed. We did see a lot happen during COVID where follow-up fell through for many, many patients for, uh, as everyone knows, a variety of reasons, fear of coming in, reduced accessibility to dermatologists and the melanoma programs. And as a result, we're seeing thicker tumors come through the door. So we can't emphasize how important getting patients back in for routine follow-up, particularly if they have atypical mole patterns, strong family history, strong personal history of melanoma is. 
Yeah, you know, I tell my patients um, when I first see them because there is this issue of long-term lifetime follow-up. You know, where you had your melanoma, the sun didn't just strike that one spot. It sort of struck all over. Uh, because a lot of people think, oh, I had my surgery, I'm done. Because it is considered, you know, definitive therapy. But I do explain that they're at risk for other skin cancers as well as other melanomas. Um, so it's something that people also tend to forget as they get farther out. Um, but we are seeing this huge number of patients coming back with COVID sort of, hard to say, is it on the wane? Are we in endemics? Hard to say right now, we're sort of in flux. But um, so there's a huge bolus of patients coming back and it's very difficult to get in, unfortunately. Um, for example, at UCSF, and it's not confined to dermatology, we're booked six months out, very unusual. Normally we get people in within a, a week or two, but all these patients are trying to get back in. So it's been quite the impact. So those were my big questions. Any other, anything else you'd like to add for primary or secondary prevention before we go to questions or anything? I know Marie and I are just itching to talk about our novel technologies, but you know, I, I, we had hoped, we, we published uh, one of the key articles in, at Stanford coming out of our, um, our Department of Artificial Intelligence and Computer Science in 2017. Um, a, a manuscript that really suggested that artificial intelligence-based um, early detection strategies might change the field. And this was, of course, published with much consternation among the dermatology community, assuming that, well, there'll be no need for dermatologists, and that's just not the case. But, you know, AI, when we take it to now prospective studies, real-world clinical validation doesn't always perform like we want it to. And we think more of augmented intelligence now that combines artificial intelligence and other advanced technologies to enhance human interactions with patients, enhance human care to actually sort of this wayfinding has come up through an article recently published in JAMA about how the AI-based technologies can help us distill information to more usable um, degrees and then to make more important and valid clinical decisions on that basis. So I think with what's happening with molecular imaging and technologies that will help us to improve early diagnosis and, and with technologies that include potentially AI, but also imaging technologies like confocal microscopy and other modalities that are being used that we really um, have a very bright future for prevention. And then just one nod to chemo prevention. So beyond sunscreen, there's been discussion and research on um, melanin synthesizing products that would actually make your skin darker without the use of the sun, harmful ultraviolet light, and then perhaps prevent melanoma or other agents that are antioxidants or non anti-inflammatory drugs. So there's a whole host of research being done worldwide to try to find safe vitamins and supplements that might help prevent melanoma at the outset in, in addition to some of those novel pigment synthesizing products. Yeah, I wanted to add to that. Um, really wanted to emphasize that in the beginning of AI, there was so much uh, excitement about how it was going to get rid of human error and just uh, revolutionize everything. And well, when you think of it, if you get rid of human error, you're getting rid of humans, really. And so AI took, you know, thought about that a little bit, the whole field. And um, I just went to a conference on Monday, and really now the emphasis on augmenting human. Uh, performance. And just as uh, studies have shown that if you have a dermatologist and a primary care physician, you have the thinnest detected melanoma and the best prognosis. Um, studies have shown that for melanoma screening, uh, when you look at AI plus a dermatologist, they catch more. Uh, because the AI is looking at um, different things than the dermatologist. It's complementary. Um, and the next uh, step also is ethical AI. Right? So a lot of AI is based on retrospective databases that were collected for other purposes. And what we really need is databases that are collected fit for function. And um, you know, the, the data scientists are used to getting data from, uh, let's say, a, a medical uh, collaborator, and it's transferred in a second, right? But those are retrospective databases. When you talk to them about, OK, let's go ahead and prospectively uh, collect data, they're falling off their chairs because we're talking about months to years, whereas 
my computer scientists come to me and they're apologizing. They say, oh, you know, this experiment, I'm so sorry, it's gonna take so long, it's gonna take a day. I'm going, a day? Wow, that's fantastic. So, you know, we have a little bit different timelines and different languages and working together on that. But I think the horizon um, is really bright. I think there's a lot coming down the line that can bring screening of melanoma into precision medicine and also address gaps in care that Susan uh, touched upon uh, with racial minorities and access um, issues such as that. And I guess uh, the one thing I would like to add is, you know, every time I talk about sun behaviors or, you know, behavior change, certainly it's not easy. And I always worry about the blame, right? So the intent is not to blame um, or blame yourself or any of that. It's really about how can we make it just a little bit better? So a way that I describe prevention um, or that I think is really helpful is that, you know, thinking about having a cup and every risk factor that you have, pour some water in that cup. Right, so you have red hair, pour some water in. You have light skin, you pour some water in. You indoor tanned when you were younger, pour some water in. And so, and eventually that cup overflows and you're gonna have melanoma. And so the thought really is to try to reduce that cup as much as you can. And some of that we can't control, right? You can't control your hair color, really, your natural hair color. Uh, so, you know, um, you know we, we can't control some of that, but other, you know, our sun exposure is something that we can have a little bit of control over um, and be really thoughtful about. And so I, I don't want you to leave here, you know, blaming yourself, thinking about that sunburn you got last summer, you know, I, I don't want that. Um, but be thinking about what can I do different just a little bit Right? So maybe it's you put sunscreen on your face every morning so that you never think about it. Maybe you keep an umbrella or a, something to give you shade in your car so that the next time you're at a soccer game, you have a shade, um, you know, something with you. So, so thinking about how you can make it routine without blaming. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was wonderful. I think we can probably open up to questions, but I do also want to echo and say thank you to Cody Michael and the MRA have been coming to this forum for many years, and it's great to see dermatology and early detection voices really increasing each year at these meetings. So thank you for that. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Um, earlier, you were talking about some chemicals that would be helpful in sunscreens, but they're not FDA approved. And so I was wondering why it's hard to make, make progress like this in America and what we could possibly do to help that process. You know, I, I remember bringing this up at an MRA meeting when there was an FDA um, group at one of the lunchtime forums. And I think it's recognized as an issue, but in 2002, um, European sunscreen manufacturers filed the time and extent application through the FDA for seven superior UV mo uh, molecules, UV filters, based on their decades of safety and efficacy around the world. Um, these were filed for 180-day approval so that the studies didn't have to be recapitulated in the U.S. Uh, in that, it's called TEA, it's a time and extent application. So nothing happened. There was a bill, uh, you know, um, that was the sunscreen or sunshine coalition worked on this and sunscreen, in sunscreen Innovation Act in 2014 that was published to then push the FDA to make a decision. So in March 2015, the FDA's decision was to ask all of those companies and those eight molecules to be refiled. And nothing's happened since then except they've taken the molecule Mexorol out of the Anthelios products in the U.S. because that was the only thing that had happened in the U.S. in 2005. Um, so I think it's been very frustrating. It's a very slow process and now again you have the FDA saying that the only sunscreens that are generally regarded as safe and effective are the mineral sunscreens because they're not absorbed to the skin at all. Um, and again, as we've mentioned, those sunscreens may not be as effective. How to push the FDA to accelerate the pace of getting better UV filters into our sunscreens. I think people have been really trying to battle this for now 20 years. And I don't know what the answer is. Obviously, with a public health crisis like COVID, I think sunscreen safety and technology gets pushed aside. But it shouldn't because we know it makes a difference in addition to the things Maria was talking about and Rachel with behaviors, sun protective behaviors and clothing. So, you know, 
I think we just have to keep pushing um, and hopefully there, I have heard, you know, now more undercurrents that the FDA is recognizing the deficiency or insufficiency of our sunscreens compared to those abroad, but I don't know how to move that needle more. So probably patient advocacy groups really need to push. Yeah. Yeah, one thing that the FDA was poised to do right before COVID was increase the UVA protection in sunscreens and that was proposed and then completely pushed to the side. And so one thing we have to remember is that the SPF currently rating on uh, sunscreens is for UVB. It does not address UVA. And UVA, unlike UVB, uh, the intensity is this pretty much the same throughout the day. It's not like UVA that goes up in the midday and comes back down. And people tend to forget that because um, UVA, the evidence shows that it contributes to melanoma formation as well. And so that's something that they're really poised to do and it comes, you know, came to a, a halt. Um, and, and they're really sort of um, consumed by other things right now. But it also might come down to funding and um, personnel, how much, how much resource they have to devote to this. Hello, how's everybody doing? Uh, on the panel. My name is Chris Carr and I am a patient advocate. I'm stage three melanoma. Um, about two and a half years ago, I was diagnosed and have acro litiginous melanoma. So it's not one that was theoretically influenced by UV. Um, as part of my treatment, I had my pinky toe amputated, which was the site of the melanoma. And I did 13 months of immunotherapy, which has led to changes in my skin. So two questions, and it may be too large of a question for this forum, but while well, I have you all here. <laughs> um, a, is there anything I can do in terms of prevention when it comes to acryl other than quitting cigarettes and lifestyle changes along like diet and not stressing? Um, and now that my skin is light, I never got sunburned. And I was in Miami last year for about, I was out for an hour and I came home and my face started hurting. And I don't know what sunburn is. I've been to Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Hawaii, Dubrovnik. I've never been sunburned. So I don't know what the timetable is on how long to be in the sun when you're fairer skinned. So I guess those would be my two questions. I can just note on the acral melanoma issue, you know, melanoma in non-sun exposed areas on the palms and the soles and mucosal areas is not going to be affected by sun protection, right? We don't, we don't really know. There's a host of research that the MRA has really, you know, supported on acral melanoma. What causes it? Is it more biologically aggressive? Does it have a higher rate of lymph node positivity? Does it behave differently and respond differently to medications and drugs? It doesn't tend to have the BRAF mutation. So it's probably like some head and neck melanoma is a very different biologic player. So preventing um, disease recurrence is different from present preventing it from the outset. And we don't know how to tell patients to prevent acral melanoma. There's just no data. And that's true across all racial ethnic groups. As, as Henson alluded to, we see more acral melanomas in darker skinned individuals who are simply at a lower risk of getting the more sun-related melanomas that lighter skinned individuals also get. Um, for preventing disease from coming back, you know, I hope we have agents and, and supplements that will, tell, will prevent that sort of you know, tertiary prevention of preventing disease recurrence beyond the immunotherapies, but we haven't yet identified um, certain medications or drugs that patients should take to try to prevent a disease from coming back apart from the immunotherapies and adjuvant therapies that are now being given um, in patients with resected disease. The skin lightening and skin changes that can occur from immunotherapy or the skin sensitivities that have happened or, or rashes that people get. We don't like to use the word rash in dermatology. We give it a name. So dermatitis is a specific type. Dermatologists need to be there in the randomized controlled studies quantifying and characterizing these rashes. That's my plug there. But, um, you know, we, we, um, you know, we don't um, know how long some of these last. They can be a very long-lived problem with skin sensitivity or, you know, sun sensitivity in a person who has been on one of the targeted immunotherapies despite coming off that therapy. And so um, I don't have a perfect answer for you, but I would, you know, step up sun protection even though traditionally you haven't had to use it. I don't know, Marie, do you have any experience with that, with uh, sort of long-term sun sensitivity in somebody on immunotherapy? Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. I did want to point out, though, that immunotherapy does not uh, have effect against primary melanomas. 
we do see uh, people who are right in the midst of uh, their immunotherapy and they get a second primary. Um, so, and that's because of the T cells. The um, primaries don't seem to attract as many T cells as metastatic melanoma. And you have to have a certain density of tumor infiltrating T cells in order for immunotherapy to work. So, for example, often um, in clinical trials, they'll biopsy the metastatic lesions to see how many T cells you have. And a, generally, a threshold of 10% is needed. Um, but I do agree with Susan that um, it looks like sun protection is uh, in your future. The sun is not your friend anymore. Um, but it's a, it's a really uh, an open research question now what uh, preventative agents can be used besides sunscreen. And Susan and I were on a paper together that kind of reviewed the uh, things in the pipeline, things that people are considering and people are researching. But again, it's not ready. Uh, for clinical use. Hi, I have a question. Um, I had my first melanoma five years ago, um, stage 2C, and I since had four more that were stage 1 and in situ. Um, so it sounds like when people have stage two today, they might be put on an immunotherapy. Um, but I, my oncologist has not recommended that since then. Is that something I should be talking to him about? No, the adjunct, Hussein can speak probably more clearly to the actual um, time frame in Keynote 716, which was the adjuvant PEMBRO trial. Um, and I don't know if Jason Luke's gonna talk about it tomorrow, but usually adjuvant therapy trials are within a certain number of days of the surgery. So in the old days, it was after lymph node surgery. So interferon was given within 56 days. Most of the time, an oncologist would start that drug probably no later than three months after definitive surgery. There's always some leeway. But as you move out farther from the disease, I'm not sure how long ago you said your stage 2C was five years ago. Almost five years ago, Thank yeah, goodness. four and a half. Thank goodness, because stage 2C melanoma comes back early. So you have a strong likelihood that surgery took care of it entirely. So there wouldn't be any indication to start adjuvant therapy. You kind of declared yourself as likely having successfully fought that tumor. And so that adjuvant therapy discussion, this has to come up all the time. We, we saw a patient the other day who was about nine months out from a tumor, and I, he has very... Um, dangerous attributes within the tumor, high, high mitotic rate, and had, you know, ulceration, but he's nine months out. And so we don't have the data to support that we should give him adjuvant therapy, the caveat being that if the disease comes back, we would give him immunotherapy in the, you know, right away. But I don't know if you want to add to that, because I, I was trying to find in Jason's slides, but usually those therapies are given within a very, very defined short period of time after the surgery, and then you would, that's the adjuvant setting. So for my subsequent melanomas, I, I'm, a, I, I'm pretty sure they were all new primaries. They're I mean, they primaries. would know if it was a recurrence, right? Like so they, re recurrence is very different. There's a harmless type of recurrence that is in the scar itself that has an in situ component, involves the top layer of the skin, the epidermis, and we just re-excise that by and large. Sometimes it would warrant a lymph node biopsy, but that's not common. But when you have, um, that's, there's a, a dangerous recurrence that actually is a lymphatic recurrence in and around the scar, satellite metastasis or in transit between the scar and the lymph node basin, which is a stage three recurrence. And those patients are having that tumor resected and now often going on adjuvant therapy. But when you get these new tumors that are melanomas in situ, another thin melanoma, the five melanomas, these are all new primary melanomas. So ways to prevent those deal with the sunscreen, sun protective behaviors, maybe a chemopreventive agent if we can ever find and identify the right one. But they are not going to affect your overall prognosis. You take each one separately. Okay. Also, I like that term you use, declare yourself successfully. Like, I think everybody should just do that. <laughs> if it were that easy. <laughs>
Thank you for being part of this panel. It's just been very enlightening and very inspirational. Um, my husband and I started a, a small nonprofit in Miami, Florida, after the loss of our son to mel uh, metastatic melanoma. He was 29 years old. Our focus is to um, advocate within the Latino and uh, African-American communities because we feel that they are the communities that have the least amount of information and accessibility to preventive medications and preventive treatment. And uh, so we, we have a, an educational program for uh, families with young children and young adults living at home. And um, the question is, we've been talking a lot here today about adult melanoma, but I, I haven't heard much about pediatric and uh, w at what age should these parents not mind you? Mo most of these parents have never had a, a check with a dermatologist themselves. So much less have they taken their child or young adult a child living at home to a dermatologist. At what age do you recommend um, in the pediatric world for a child to be uh, examined on an annual basis through, through dermatology? Pediatric melanoma is so rare that we usually recommend that children are screened by a pediatrician and that growing and changing lesions are referred. And we have a large population of pediatric melanoma um, that I've followed at Stanford since I joined the faculty in 1994. So I have about 75 patients of individuals diagnosed under the age of 21. Um, we actually have a growing burden of disease in the Latinx and Asian young child population. Um, and we reported this uh, in a manuscript a few years ago that we were seeing more melanomas on the extremities and more amelanotic melanomas, meaning clinically not pigmented, in individuals with darker skin. Um, and then there were issues, many issues related to delay in diagnosis on that basis in the same way we see delays in African-American populations with melanomas on the foot that are misdiagnosed as just benign racial differences in pigmentation or the talon noir or fungal infection. So I think one issue is that we need to increase the awareness of what a growing or changing lesion looks like regardless of skin type and get individuals in earlier. If something is a bug bite that keeps growing and elevating um, on the skin, it doesn't go away. Um, it could be a harmless lesion, but we've got to get those patients into care. And Maria's done an incredible job you know, with socioeconomic status and looking at different racial ethnic differences with a fantastic paper that was published recently. And we have a Wipeout Melanoma California initiative that's really now targeting lower socioeconomic status and Latinx populations for improved early detection. But the pediatric melanoma question is difficult. A lot of it isn't necessarily sun-related, particularly in children with darker skin. Um, but again, we have so many patients who come to us from the Central Valley and, and a, a large Latinx um, proportion of patients and very low awareness of the risk at all of developing melanoma in the Latinx population, things we found on our Wipeout Melanoma California initiative. And then again, this problem with the tumors looking like a wart or a bug bite, not looking at all like the typical melanomas we might see in lighter skin individuals. So we have a lot to learn about um, pediatric melanoma. There is a registry that, that I participate in. Our group does, it's a national registry, but there's a lot to learn about pediatric melanoma. I agree, um, and our, our numbers are very low. Out of uh, more than 8,000 melanomas seen at UCSF since 1985, we've had about exactly 60 to 70. It's very, very low. Um, and the, the characteristics are quite different, actually. Um, Kelly Cordoro mm -hmm. uh, from uh, UCSF has written a paper on the characteristics of pediatric melanoma there. Very different from adult melanoma. As Susan pointed out, much higher incidence of amelanotic. And the, really the key hallmark in uh, pediatric melanoma is change, um, rather than looking funny because um, the, in the pediatric population you also have something called a spitz nevus, which can mimic the melanoma. Um, and sometimes can be difficult to discern even on path. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question of who should go. Generally, uh, the children of folks that have been genetically tested for germline mutations, um, we don't even uh, see them very early because the pediatricians do such a good job. Mm -hmm. The pediatricians are very good at skin exams, so it's later 
when they're referred by pediatricians, or sometimes the parents bring them in because they're worried. Uh, but typically, moles, you know, um, develop slowly uh, and um, really start to come thick and fast in the teens and in your 20s. Um, so really, early um, pediatric exams can be done very well by the pediatrician. I think we have time for one more question, Cody. I'd like to ask you, I know you can't name the sunscreens. Oh, I actually can. Oh, I'm you happy can. to. I'm happy, I'm happy just want, to. I was one. I just said, I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Sorry. Um, so if you, if, I'll give you actually a really simple answer is just um, use, Google the term Tinosorb, T-I-N-O-S-O-R-B. Tinosorb is, there's two chemicals that'll come up. It's got a very long chemical name with a dibenzyl methyl triazine. But typically, you'll find either it'll say bisoctrizol or bimetrizinol. There's tinosorb S and tinosorb M. Um, they happen to be in anthelios sunscreens outside of the U.S., not inside the U.S. The anthelios sunscreens in the U.S. are no different than copper tone or banana boat. Again, they took out Mexoril in 2015. The price point is still high. So if you're going to get anthelios sunscreens, buy them abroad. And they are available everywhere. They're in the airport in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. I, I told my daughter who was coming from a trip, I said, go to the airport pharmacy and bring me home as much sunscreen as you can. I take checked luggage so I can get sunscreen from abroad. Um, we, we, Avene, A-V-E-N-E, if uh, we was, I was, had the pleasure of being in, in, in Mont Blanc doing the tour and I saw in the, the an entire wall of orange, because the anthelios is orange and white and the Avene is in an orange, they both have all the good sunscreens. Uvenol, Uvenol is another good, U-V-I-N-O-L is another good and superior filter. So there are a number of chemical names, but if you look at Tinosorb, you'll get to learn about it. And even the Environmental Working Group has now not found any deficiencies that I'm aware of with the Tinosorb. Tinosorb is not the name of a sunscreen. It's a trademark name for those ingredients, which is either the, the bisoctrizol or bimetrizinol. Um, I refer patients to a pharmacy in Canada. I have no stock in the pharmacy. Um, and I, well, they've been quite reliable, and when a lot of patients we have will, will um, order from that pharmacy. And that I should probably not mention. That sounds like it's a problem. But, but we found, you know, because the problem is patients go online and they, they look up anthelios and find it, and then they order it from Amazon, and it's just the same as what's in CVS and it, in the U.S., and it's not going to be the same. So it, they're, they're remarkably different. I've now convinced my daughters in their 20s of the merits of these sunscreens because they've had enough sunburns with the U.S. brands including minerals, so they really are remarkable. And every red-headed patient I have, I, I want on that. Are you on the sunscreen yet? I'm gonna give you some. Time. I was just gonna say, please. <laughs> Although I do so, use a vein, I'm we, very happy to hear that you like that. And I do, like I that. have to, though, I mean, what Maria said too, is you know, sunscreens are not palatable to a lot of people. I, I also work at our VA Palo Alto, and the elderly veteran population has almost nothing to do with sunscreens, and men don't tend to use sunscreens as much as women, so protective clothing, hats, eyewear, anything that someone will use in a judicious and regular fashion, and not be a hermit, be outside and enjoying life and healthy activities outdoors, that's what we want to really promote. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you again. Let's have a, a nice round of applause. <laughs>